Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, the Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on the Jet Setter Show. It only happens twice a year. And the next Meet the Masters event happens on March 4th through 6th, 2011, in beautiful Orange County, California. With our panel of experts, we're putting enough real estate brain power in one room to make Donald Trump flinch. Meet the Masters is a powerhouse education that can revolutionize how you think about money and wealth in totally unique and incredibly innovative ways. You will learn the smart way to choose properties by market and micro-market, entity structuring for financial protection and privacy, how to grab every tax benefit the law allows and save on life's largest expense, how to put together the most creative financing package possible, the hidden power of the 1031 exchange, how to easily invest in dynamic growth markets outside of California. You'll also receive one-on-one coaching from a professional real estate investment counselor. At Platinum Properties, no one falls through the cracks. We want you to succeed, and we're determined to do everything in our power to make that happen. Will you be any closer to financial freedom in one year? Three days can make all the difference if you simply have the courage to take action on your dreams. The reality is that you can fire your boss and live life on your own terms sooner than you think. For more information about the Meet the Masters event and how to receive a $950 discount, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash events. It's my pleasure to welcome Robert Landori to the show. He is the author of Havana Harvest, and today we are going to talk about the sort of secret world that is hidden from the view of most, and we'll talk about money laundering and offshore banking and all sorts of interesting stuff. Robert, welcome. Thank you for having me on your show. My pleasure. So tell us a little bit about your background, if you would. I I know that you worked in the Cayman Islands, and you've done all sorts of interesting stuff. Well, my life has been a bit of a how should I put it, uh, a mouvement, as they say in French. There was a lot of action in it. I live in Canada. I was a public accountant, and as such, I was in the Cayman Islands for a while as a bankruptcy trustee liquidating Cayman Island banks. Naturally, everybody who talks to me today wants to know about how much money is hidden in the Cayman Islands. They want to know whether there are any presidents of the United States or any other members of the administration who have hidden money. They want to know whether there are any top-notch executives who have monies hidden there. They want to know what the percentage of Hollywood celebrities have money out there. Then they ask me whether there are any rulers, such as, you know, kings and prime ministers and presidents of countries. And that's very topical, actually, that one, because Mubarak, who recently, of course, stepped down in Egypt, forced to, they're speculating that he has up to $70 billion in offshore assets, huh? I would not be surprised. Well, you know, I mean, he's been there. He's been at the trough for an awful long time. He was there for 30 years. He wouldn't be the only one. I mean, uh, and anybody that you can think of who's been at it, Noriega from Panama, right? Batista in Cuba, uh, just to mention two. Salinas in Mexico, Mr. Taylor and Samuel Doe, Liberia. I mean, the Shah, you know, Shah Pahlavi from Iran before it became a, an Islamic Republic. I'm sure that they have all had and have money offshore and hidden. I don't know whether Mubarak has 70 billion, but that's a lot of money, 70 billion. Sure is. Well, how are these people able to do it? I mean, your book looks so fascinating, by the way, and I'm having a little trouble understanding at what angle you're you're coming from. I mean, do people consult with you, for example, on how to keep money offshore? 
or is, are you more of a, a person just writing about how people do it and how they're laundering their money and, and so forth? Or, or do people ask you how to protect their assets and things like that? People actually don't ask me. I write about it in books because, you know, I'm a fiction writer and essentially I write thrillers. But, you know, nothing happens in the world without a money transaction taking place. Incidentally, have you any idea of how many money transactions take place in the world in one day? Oh my gosh, I, w I would have no idea. It must be an enormous number, but please do tell us. Are you ready for this one? I'm sitting down. I'm ready. 13, yeah, 13 trillion transactions a day. 13 trillion transactions a day. That is an amazing, amazing thing. What a world we live in. And you know that I have Landori's Law, which says that 13 trillion is also the amount of money in U.S. dollar value that are in secret banking offshore accounts. There are two kinds of offshore accounts, you know, the perfectly legal ones. For example, General Motors or Citibank have offshore because they're not in the United States of America. Then there is one, what is called the flight or illegal offshore money, and that is, I, in my estimate, about $13 trillion. And um, who has it? Where they have it? Well, the Cayman Islands is one place. Everybody thinks that there's a lot in Hong Kong. But, you know, actually, in Hong Kong, there's only about 7% of all the offshore money that is hidden there is illegal money. In my book, in my books, I should say, uh, the one that you have read is Helvana Harvest, in Havana Harvest, of course, the Cuban drug money is funneled through a Cayman bank account. In the, my other book, which appeared about a month ago, which is called Fatal Greed, there is a whole series of money transactions, which is very interesting for people who read because it's, it's kind of sophisticated. You know, the, the guy m manages to get his money offshore with gold bars, and he manages also to do what is known as an offshore IPO, I don't know how familiar you are with IPO. I am, but before I ask you about the offshore IPO idea, how does he get his gold offshore? I mean, does he he doesn't take it on an airplane through TSA? I assume, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, what you know? I, I, I think if I went through TSA on on a boat, yeah, he takes it on a the boat. They're not it's checking simple. security. I mean, he's or he's he's got his own boat. Exactly, exactly. I see. He gets his own boat. He puts it in, a, in a, a hidden place in his boat and sails away. I mean, who's going to know? Nobody knows. I mean, theoretically speaking, right? You get on your boat here in, the, in Montreal, where I live. You go down the intercoastal waterway out into the Caribbean, sail around Bahamas, and you either drop it off there or you go to the Cayman Islands. The problem is, of course, that you can't walk into a, a bank with four kilos or 400 kilos of gold without somebody knowing who you are. So you have to make arrangements in advance, but that's possible. That's just one way. I mean, there are many ways. Well, tell us a little bit about the offshore IPO. Well, the offshore IPO goes like this. A company like Google goes public, right? They announce it way, way ahead of time, and everybody wants to get an allotment, an allotment of shares because they know that when the, the, the initial public offering hits the, the street, the value of the shares will go up rapidly in the first few days. So it's hard to get so-called allotments. Somebody who has an in organizes an uh, allotment for an offshore account with an offshore broker, a stock broker. They buy the shares that are allotted, the shares go up, they sell the shares, and the profit stays offshore. Done deal. Uh, this was done many, many times and often when the IPO craze was still operational. Right, right. And a lot of people use these international business corporations or IBCs to grow wealth offshore. But the prime motivation for doing it is e either what? It's to evade taxes or legally grow money outside of your country and, and, and report it on, on your taxes or hide assets from creditors, lawsuits, litigation, so forth. Or all of the above. I mean, one of, the, one of the typical things is, you know, when there's a messy divorce, people try, one of the parties always tries to move their, their money out of the jurisdiction in, in which they live. And, of course, they put it offshore, and then they bring it back again. I mean, there's nothing illegal about that, except that it's not really fair play. Well, so who do you find doing this? I mean, is this for the super wealthy? Is it for the regular middle class person that's doing it? I think nowadays more and more, more and more people are really becoming aware of this. And, and they're, they're starting to look at options like this. They're afraid of litigation in the U.S. or, or, or Canada, but the U.S. is, of course, worse. Canada is getting tough. Look, this whole thing started, you know, the so-called offshore secret accounts started in Switzerland in the 30s. 
when Hitler came to power and the Jews of, of Germany had to go somewhere to keep their money safe. So they migrated to uh, Zurich and they deposited their money and opened what was called a numbered account. It didn't have a name and it didn't have a nationality. All it had was a number. All you had to do is to have a numbered account. If you knew the number, you could access it. If you didn't know the number, you couldn't. That's how it started. And then, of course, it became fashionable. And the driver, the, um, the initial major driver, was tax avoidance. To put it mildly, it's actually called tax evasion. Yeah, maybe evasion more seriously, but mildly, yes, sir. That's right. And then, of course, there are other things that are perfectly legitimate. I mean, lo look, a large corporation that has business all over the world, right, can do what is known as transfer pricing. You buy your raw material, let's say, in, in France, and you sell it to yourself in your Argentinian um, factory. So you do what is known as transfer pricing. You determine that particular value, right? So some of it stays in, um, in, in a tax haven place. And you grow that tax-free, but when you import it back to where you live, you have to pay the, the, the tax. So that, again, is nothing illegal. And large U.S. banks have offshore accounts. Look, China has trillions of dollars invested in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. That's all offshore money to them because right. it's not in China. So by definition, it's very difficult to say this is offshore, this is not offshore. No, I understand that, but that's sort of the the traditional or above-board way of doing it. In your book, though, you, you profile all sorts of interesting characters. Deputy Director of Counterterrorism and Counter-Narcotics with the CIA, a Brigadier General, a Cuban Deputy Minister of the Interior, your own friend, and Acting Director of the CIA, Miami Immigration Attorney, a Mossad officer. Wow, this is... I mean, what, a, what an international world. This is so fascinating. I tried to make it interesting, and I tried to make it international. Um, I based the novel to which you refer, which is Havana Harvest, and which incidentally is, is out there uh, both in paperback and in digital form. Uh, Havana Harvest was modeled, uh, or I should say based, on a very sad story of a Cuban general whom the Castro brothers accused of having done drugs and helping the Medellin cartel smuggle drugs into the United States through uh, Cuban waters. And, of course, uh, many people believe that this was a frame-up because they wanted to get rid of him. His name was Arnaldo Ochoa. And, uh, you know, they tried him, they found him guilty, and they shot him three days after. And many people say that the reason why they did it is because they wanted to get rid of him. Other people say that he really took the blame for everybody, including the Castro brothers who knew that they were doing drugs in order to earn foreign currency. That was the basic story behind my book. I was so incensed by this because Ochoa, General Ochoa, was a very close friend of Raul Castro and Che Guevara, and it was a real double, double, double cross. So I, I fictionalized it, and I made him a hero, and that's why you have all of these people who indeed uh, uh, get involved in the story. And I have a Cuban general, and he's trying to be a decent guy, and he's trying to, to tell the U.S. US what's going on, and everybody's after him. That's why there are so many high-ranking people. And I also in the, indicate how treachery is rampant in these worlds of high combudgery. That's why you have a deputy director. I'm sorry, you have a... Yes, you have a deputy director of the CIA who turns out to be spying for Castro. Tell us more about some of the adventures of the, this cast of characters. I mean, I didn't even get down to the Cuban army captain, British businessman, a coin dealer, Cuban minister of defense, etc. What are some of the things they encounter? I mean, this is a very treacherous world, as you mentioned. Yes. The, the British businessman was uh, modeled on a Canadian businessman who started doing business just in, in Cuba, just as the revolution triumphed. And he began, let's call a spade a spade, he began, began to smuggle goods that the United States didn't want Cuba to have. Uh, so he smuggled it into, into Cuba. And I modeled uh, the character on, on, on this man. The deputy director of, uh, the, of the CIA, quite frankly, I don't know any deputy directors of the CIA, but that's how I imagined them. <laughs> Cuba, uh, the <laughs> right. <laughs> that's great. I love it. I've been to Langley. I've been to Langley. Okay. I saw the building. I've, you know, the, you know the, the commercial. 
I am a, I'm not a brain surgeon, but I, I, I stayed at the Holiday Inn. The Holiday Inn Express. Did you ever see that ad? Oh, many the, times, many times. I think those are really funny. But the other one, the other one that I referred to, uh, which is called Fatal Greed, I modeled that on a, a, a fellow who wouldn't give me my commission for having found him $20 million because he was in the blood business. But that's another story. You liked my book, did you? Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. So can and should people be using offshore banking and so forth? Or is it really a dirty world where people are pulling scams and getting ripped off? Or is it a legitimate thing for a, a regular person? I mean, you gave the examples of large global corporations. Of course, they're doing it. But, but some people, you see, uh, some people who have a son that's studying offshore, have to have an offshore account in order to pay the guy's tuition fee. If, if you have a son, for the sake of argument, who's at the University of Bologna in Italy, right? You're, you, you want to establish a so-called offshore account, and you're not going to establish it in Italy. You're going to go to Zurich, and you have, and, and you have an offshore account, and you're going to pay his study fees and his, um, you know, his food, etc., etc., bills from there. So that's a perfectly legitimate thing. And there are many, many reasons for many, many people who are perfectly normal, ordinary, honest citizens who can have offshore accounts. Uh, you can have a trading company and you can, you can direct money much easier from an offshore place if you're buying a lot of goods from China, for example. Uh, you go through Hong Kong. So there are perfectly legitimate ways of doing offshore business and having offshore accounts. But of course, we're not talking about that. The fascinating part of it is who does it in a way that it is tax sensitive from the point of view of the United States and Canada. You know that uh, there's a German guy who's uh, actually a Swiss guy who is now selling the names of, of clients of the Swiss bank to the IRS. So that was a big thing that came out last year, and the Obama administration has really been attacking this kind of stuff, and they did an amnesty for a while to get people to fess up and just pay their tax bill. But I hear that Swiss bankers don't even want to take American accounts anymore, right? That is right, because the Swiss banks are exposed. They're exposed because they have a lot of money in, in the United States and in Canada, and they know that if the United States retaliates, and if the Swiss bankers don't fall in line, they're going to get hit economically in a very, very decisive way. Consequently, they don't want to take that risk, and they don't want to take any more accounts from Canada or the United States. But as I said, there are a lot of people whose money originates from the 1930s, Jewish people who had their money right from there, and some people actually inherited generation after generation offshore money. And they have to be, this, this problem has to be resolved and, uh, resolved, and amnesty has to be granted to the people who are in, who are in that unfortunate position. Otherwise, uh, most of their money would just disappear because they would have to pay taxes, interest, and, you know, fines. It's, uh, how do I put it to you? It, can you stop this? The answer is no, because there always will be some of this stuff going on. But for the ordinary Joe, a man who works in a, in, in a company where he gets his salary and where, you know, where he's a middle, middle income earner, there's no sense in having an offshore account. But offshore account keeping is expensive. I mean, you have to open an offshore account, you have to communicate with it, you have to pay a management fee, etc., etc., etc. Unless you have a million bucks, it's not worth even thinking about it. Oh, really? Okay. All right. So are, are there any advice in amongst the, the fiction writing, which is always based on some degree of truth for sure, and, and in your case, probably a large degree of truth. Is there any advice that you have for offshore account holders or things like that on, on best practices? Yes. Have a wonderful accountant and have an even better lawyer. And listen to what they have to say. Don't do anything foolish, because a lot of these offshore how do I put it to you, very attractive offers are really schemes to defraud you. I mean, Madoff had some money offshore. Over here in Canada, we had a couple of people who were actually uh, collecting money and uh, swindled people out of hundreds of millions of dollars. It was just a, a straight grab. Uh, you know, they said offshore, 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 uh, interest uh, without taxes, etc., etc. And, you know, when they had $100 million, they pulled the plug. To pull the plug is very simple. All you do is you buy a piece of property for $100 million, for example, right? And you sell it for a million. You've lost $99 million, right? How come you did that? Because I made a mistake, he says, right? I made a mistake. I lost the money. Where's the money? Somewhere safe in another account in the same jurisdiction. I mean, the chicanery that goes on is incredible. 
you, you, you talked about Mubarak. You know why he has so much money offshore? Well, he's been taking the U.S. aid that should have been going to his country, right? For example. But he was also getting ready for a very, very nasty shock because he knew that one day he's going to have to run, like all the other guys who had to run. Like Noriega of Panama had to run, and uh, Idi Amin had to run, and uh, half a dozen other people. Salinas, the great Mexican wonder boy, he really ripped off his country. Uh, I mean, you know, it's it's just, there it is. Greed, my friend, greed. It's certainly sad. It's It really is. Well, you've got several other books, right? Well, I've written this book, Havana Harvest, uh, which you can, you know, the, the best thing to do is to go to robertlandori.com, which is one word, robertlandori.com. I wrote, I wrote a book about Cuba. I wrote another book called Fatal Greed, which is about a, a company that mismanufactures a bunch of surgical glue and poisons the entire world. I wrote another one. I'm in the process of writing a book, which is a continuation of this particular book that I just mentioned, called Mayhem on the Danube. And before that, I wrote a book which was called Tacho's Money. Tacho by the way, was Anastasio Somoza, who was the dictator of Nicaragua. And this fella stole $40 million from, from the CIA, and the CIA stole it back. <laughs> well, it's good that the CIA stole it back, I guess, huh? Yeah, it was good. Actually, you know, everybody that knocks the CIA, they're not, they're not that bad. They're not that bad. They're a necessary evil. Everybody has a CIA. Robert, do you think we'll see a movie out of any of your books in the near future? It this seems like this seems like a recipe for a, a Born Identity movie or, or something interesting, a James Bond movie. Well, I, listen, tell you what, I'll give you a commission if you find me someone who wants to do a, 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 a film because they're all filmable. All my, you see, I think in pictures. Consequently, I write in pictures. And therefore, all the scenes are pictures or movies. My books are very, very good as a subject or basis of a movie. But so far, nobody's breaking down the doors. But wait, soon, as soon as Havana Harvest becomes a bestseller. Now, now you sent me a review copy of Havana Harvest. Is it out in the stores yet? Uh, Havana Harvest is out and has been out since the 1st of September. So people can get it on Amazon.com and they all can of get the it on Amazon, usual places. Right. And they can, of course, get it on Kindle uh, because it's on Kindle as well as in uh, paperback. Fantastic. Yeah, Kindle is and so convenient. Fate, and Fatal Greed, so Fatal Greed is also out on Amazon uh, in digital form. So if the people really want to have a complete picture of of the chicanery that goes on in offshore accounts, let them buy both books. They're big hits. I mean, you know, it's very expensive on the the pocketbook. One of them, I think, costs $11, and the other one costs well, as long as we can use that our offshore accounts to purchase, it should be good, right? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> well, uh, Robert, what else would you like people to know about this intriguing world? Just in wrapping things up here, stay away from it. If you don't, if you don't have the stomach to take risk, stay away from it because it can really, really bite you in the back. I mean, you know, you go offshore. First of all, you might you you run. Uh, the risk of being fleeced, and or Uncle Sam or uh, Canada will get after you and they'll take, you, they'll take all your money away anyway. So pay your taxes, be a good boy is one thing. Don't trust your politicians, but I think that, that is international. And get on with your life and try to, to make an honest living. Sure. Well, good advice. Robert Landori, thank you so much. The books can be found at robertlandori.com. And we really appreciate you sharing this intriguing world with our listeners today. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store.
This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.